let's get into our message this morning. More than a hundred years ago, a British revivalist that you probably have not heard his name, but he had an impact on somebody else whose name you've probably heard before. But this British revivalist, his name was Henry Varley, and he issued a challenge, and this challenge impacted D.L. Moody. It really shaped his life, it impacted a city, and it really impacted a generation. This is the statement that Varley made that got a hold of D.L. Moody. He said this, and, and oftentimes this quote has been attributed to D.L. Moody, but it really came from Henry Varley. He said this, The world has yet to see what God will do with and for and through and in and by the man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. How many think that's a powerful statement? It's a powerful statement. The world has yet to see what God will do. For somebody who gives themselves, who goes all in. And we're in the middle of this series we're calling All In. We're in week two of this series, All In. And we're looking at the kind of life that God calls us as believers to. What is the kind of life? What does God call us as believers? How does he call us to live? It's a life of, that is all in committed to Jesus Christ. A life that is all in committed to to the Lord. Now in Luke chapter 9 verses 23 and 24, this is kind of our base text throughout this series, Jesus issued this challenge to his disciples and this is what he said. He said this, uh, he said, uh, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. How many know that's a life of radical commitment to the Lord? Whoever would take up his cross daily and follow me. In other words, whoever would die to himself. Whoever would die to himself, that is the kind of disciple that I am looking for. And today we're going to continue this series and we're going to look at one of the men from the Old Testament and who's, who's really in the Old Testament Hall of Faith. In fact, this is somebody that we're very familiar with, that we know, and, and, uh, and in the hall of faith. But, but he had a, a moment where God called him to something of an all-in commitment that at first glance makes us at sometimes kind of bristle a little bit and kind of say, what kind of God is this that would ask that? What, why would God ask that? And so today, we're going we're gonna to look at Abraham. We're going to look at Abraham today. And we're going to look at a time in his life, and he had many tests in his life, but we're going to look at a particular time where God called him to an all-in commitment. An all-in commitment. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 22 today. So if you have your copy of God's Word, or perhaps you follow along on the screen or the app notes today, if you download our Painesville AG app, Lots of opportunities there for you to, to listen to past messages, to follow along with the, the current message notes that are there, to take a look at the calendar. There's just a lot of things on that app. It's free, so I encourage you to download that. But uh, today, let's take a look, and we're going to be looking at, at uh, Genesis chapter 22, starting in verse 1. And this is, what, this is what took place. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, and Abraham replied, here I am. And then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain that I will show you. Now, I don't know about you, but I think this is one of the most uncomfortable texts in Scripture. There are times in Scripture where there are uncomfortable texts. There are times in Scripture where if you just read a text and you have no uh, concept of, of the rest of Scripture or the rest of the Bible, you can read a text like this, and this is the kind of text that people take out of context. This is the kind of text that oftentimes you go, what kind of God would ask that? What kind of God would ask that? What, what kind of God would, 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 would say... Um, Go sacrifice your son. I, I, want you to go, I want you to go and put your son on an altar, and I want you to kill him, and I want you to offer him up to me. Now, in our day and age, that is, that is a, a type of thing that causes us to bristle and causes us to wrestle with, with questions. But you know what? What I found is, is that there's a tremendous tension be, be, because how, here because how could a loving God ask this of Abraham? That brings a tension to us. The, the God that we know and, and Abraham brings kind of a, a tension. But I found that stories like this where there's a tension that we have to press into, where there's this tension uh, that if we will press in, some of the greatest revelations 
of who God is, some of the greatest revelations that we can find about God, about his, his involvement in our lives, about what he desires, about who he is. I think if we really press in, we can find some of the greatest revelations about God if we will just press into stories like this and we'll wrestle with them. And so, so I, I think what we want to get in today is we want to take a look and we want to break this and we want to try to understand a little bit more of what is being asked of Abraham of this all-in commitment here. Now, let me, let me just say this. How many of you grew up between 1963 and 1997? How many of that, that's where you were? You were kind of, yeah, 19. Then you would remember this. You would remember this. You probably heard this, this message. You'd hear this, and then this is a test. For the next 60 stations, this, test, th this will be a test. The station will conduct a test of the emergency broadcast system. This is only a test. How many of you have ever heard that? How many know God tests our faith? God tests our faith. There are times where God tests our faith. And that's very important because the opening, if you miss the opening line, you miss what God is doing here. What it says here is sometime later, God tested Abraham. God tests Abraham. This is only a test. I want to say the God that I know, God would never, he never intended, he would have never allowed Abraham to actually go through with it in terms of sacrificing his son. But this was a test. Now, you got to understand that even in a pagan culture, and there was a pagan culture in which there was worship of other gods in which they did go and sacrifice their children. They did go and sacrifice their children to these, these other gods in an attempt to be able to please them. But even in the midst of this, our God would never do that. However, this is a test. God never intended for Abraham to sacrifice his son, and I don't believe he would have allowed it, but God was offering him a test. And for the record, I don't think this is a story about God's character as much as it is about Abraham's character. God's not the one on trial here. God is testing Abraham. He's testing the character of Abraham, and he gives him a test. And why does he test Abraham? Why does God test us? And you see, when it comes to all-in commitments, what we have to understand is that there are times where God will bring us to a place that is a test. God will bring us to a place where he is looking to test to see if we are willing to go all-in with him or whether something else has our hearts worship. Whether there's something else that has our hearts worship. Worship. You see, according to Jewish tradition, Abraham had about 10 tests that he took throughout his life. This was the final one. And this is sort of the ultimate test to determine whether Abraham was all in or not. And so the first thing that I want to highlight today when it comes to the tests of God is that God tests our faith to reveal why and what we worship. God tests our faith to reveal why and what we worship. Now I say why and what. Because why do we worship God? Sometimes there's a test that wants to determine why we have chosen to worship God. Why have we chosen to, to, to serve the Lord? And then there are tests that come, and these tests not only reveal the why of our worship, but they reveal the object or what we are worshiping. You see, I found that there are these moments in our lives where the Lord brings us to a place where he wants to test to see if we're really submitted to his lordship or not. There are difficult tests, but they reveal who's, who or what is really on the throne of our lives. Amen? And when it comes to this final test, God was asking Abraham to lay his son Isaac on the altar. Now, how many of you are familiar with the story of Abraham all the way through? If you're familiar with the story of Abraham all the way through, you know what a radical, what, what, a, what a radical thing this was. It wasn't just a matter of, of asking Abraham to sacrifice his son, but what we're talking about is we're talking about Isaac. And Isaac was the son of promise. You see, Abraham was, was uh, when, when he was older in his life, he lived in a, in a place that was called Ur of the Chaldees. And God had called him out of that and, and said, I want you to go to a land where you do not know. And there, there I will give you that land to you and to your descendants. The problem was that Abraham didn't have a descendant. Abraham had absolutely no children. He and his wife were barren, and they were very much up in age. And here it was, Abraham had gone all in at that moment in faith, and he had decided to leave everything that was familiar to him, the inheritance he would have had with his family in Ur of the Chaldees, and he decides to leave for a land he doesn't know based on a promise of God. 
And then when he gets to that land, and, and he, he begins to see there are people in that land. There are other inhabitants of that land. This is a, an ongoing process in Abraham's life where God continues to remind him of the promise that he made, and yet the promise doesn't come. In fact, Isaac was a 25-year promise. Isaac was a promise that, that Abraham waited on for 25 years. For 25 years, he waited on the promise. And he even tried to bring it about on his own, where, where, where he and his wife Sarah said, well, we're getting up there, and, you know, God said that you would have a promise. Maybe I'm the problem, Sarah's thinking. Maybe I'm the problem. Here's my maidservant, Hagar, you know, the one we picked up when we, we decided to go to Egypt when there was a famine, and we shouldn't have, and we should have stayed, and whatever. But here's Hagar, and, and you can have a child to her. And God said, no, 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 that's not the, that's not the promise. And he renews it and says, by this time next year, and at that point, Abraham was 100 and his wife Sarah was 90 and scripture says that when they were beyond the age of being able to even conceive there was a miracle child so here we have the miracle child Isaac and here it is God saying I want you to take your son your only son Isaac this precious little boy this one that is the gift for me and I want you to put him on the altar and here's what we learn right now. Here, here's something I want to point out. Here's something I want us to be careful of because sometimes we pray and we pray and we pray and we wait and we wait and we desire an answer. We desire a miracle. We, we, we need this promise. And sometimes God will give us what he has been promising. He gives us something that we have been waiting for. He gives us something what, that, that, that we have been hoping for. He, 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 he finally gives it to us. And sometimes what we get, that blessing, that gift that we receive from God can become more important to us and can actually become the object of our worship if we're not careful the very gift that we've been given and see sometimes practically speaking maybe God blesses you financially he blesses you with resources he blesses you with with money he blesses you with wealth and you're they're a blessing from God but if you aren't careful that blessing can displace God and become more important than God himself Perhaps God blesses you with a job. I know many people who out of work and they pray and they pray, oh God, give me a job, give me a job, give me a job. And God blesses them with a job. And then they throw everything they have into that job all the time, all their attention. Meanwhile, their relationship with God, the one who gave them the job, the one that answered starts to take a back seat because the job, the gift becomes more important than the Lord. Or perhaps it's a relationship. Perhaps you know, you're single, and you're praying, oh, man, I just want to get married, and then God brings that right girl, or that right guy along, that girlfriend, that boyfriend, and, and man, oh, wow, yes, 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 finally, finally, and all of a sudden, your relationship with God begins to, to, to kind of wane because you begin to put all your attention into pleasing that person. So the gift, the blessing, then turns into the obvious. It can be a number of different things. I, I, sometimes you pray for a child like Abraham and Sarah. You, you want children and God blesses you with a family, but all of a sudden you begin to put so much energy and effort into that, into your family and we're going here and we're going there and we're doing this and we're going that and we're doing everything we can to make our children the center of our world that God is no longer the center of our world. In fact, that's a bit of the culture we live in today where it's a child-centered culture. Think about that for a little bit. The problem is, another way of saying this is, is that the gifts that God gives us can become an idol. The gifts that God gives us can become an idol in our lives. And this test is to see whether God is the end-all, be-all, or whether his gifts have become the end-all, be-all. See, we exist to glorify God, don't we? But if we aren't careful, our relationship with God can become somewhat selfish in nature. God can all of a sudden become a, a means to the things that we want rather than the object of our worship. We will worship God as long as he gives us what we want. As long as he's continuing to give us what we want, we worship God. But as soon as we have what we want, we no longer need God because he's only there to give us what we want when we need it. In fact, that's somehow how some people treat their relationship with God. I know nobody in here. That's the church somewhere else. 
But it's so easy to slide away. It is so easy for the Lordship of Jesus Christ and the reasons in which we began to worship God to slip into a, I bless God, I want God because I need this in my life, rather than to worship God because of who he is. Because he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so this was a test in that moment, this was an all-in test. He wanted to know with Abraham, Abraham, you desired a son for so long. You desired an heir for so long. I know this is what you wanted. And now that you have it, this is a test. Am I still your end-all, be-all? Or now that you have Isaac, is that, is, that, is that all you want? Am I still Lord of your life? Am I still Lord of your life? And in this moment... I think that that's what, what God is asking. What's most important? Is it the gift or is it me? I mean, think about this. I got to thinking about this this week. Again, as I study, I read different things. and I got to thinking about this this week, and this kind of came across through my studies. Think about Lucifer, uh, Satan, Lucifer. That's what he was before he fell. He was, a, he was an angel, Lucifer. And it, Scripture tells us that he was the angel in charge of worship. And that he was, he was beautiful. He was beautiful in form. He was beautiful in voice. He was, he was beautiful. And he had those gifts. And originally those gifts were used to glorify God. Then Lucifer started looking in the mirror. He started reflecting on his own beauty. And he began to glorify the gift that he had been given instead of glorifying God. And the lesson of Lucifer's fall is this. Whenever you don't turn pray, whatever you don't turn into praise turns into pride. Whatever you don't turn into praise turns into pride. See, and instead of deflecting the praise to God, Lucifer let it feed his ego. And it was his sinful desire to be lifted up that led to his downfall. Friends, we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful that we don't shift away. What are, what, what are your greatest God-given gifts? What are your most significant God-ordained opportunities? What are the God-sized dreams that the Holy Spirit has conceived in your spirit? Whatever that is, that's your Isaac. Whatever you've been praying for, whatever you've been waiting for, whatever is that promise that you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and then God gave can be your Isaac. What is your Isaac? And these are the moments where God tests us, and he'll test us in the areas of what seems to be most important, in the area that, that is in our lives that we've prayed for, that we've desired, and then we have, and we, we've wanted our hearts to desire. God will test us sometimes in those areas that are most important to us because he wants to know what's, what, where our heart is at, the what and the why of our worship. How many have ever heard of Veggie Tales? If you had kids a while ago. Veggie tales, veggie tales, right? Yeah. The guy that, the, the guy that created Veggie Tales and the guy that was also Bob the Tomato, Phil Vischer, the voice of, of Bob the Tomato, he had some ups and downs and some tests in his own faith. In fact, Phil stated that, that uh, uh, he started, excuse me, he started this, this Veggie Tales with just an idea. He, he just kind of had this idea. He had some loose change. And, uh, and this, this, this loose change in this idea became Big Idea Productions. And the company sold more than 50 million videos. It grossed more uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. But it all ended, everything that he had ended with one lawsuit. Phil himself said, 14 years work of work flashed before my eyes. The characters, the songs, the impact, the letters from the kids all over the world, it all flashed before my eyes and it all vanished. See, Big Idea had to declare bankruptcy. And the dream died a painful death. And that's when Phil heard a sermon that saved his soul. That if God gives you a dream, the dream comes to life and God shows up in it, then the dream dies. It may be that God wants to see what is most important to you. The dream or him. The dream or him. See, there are times where we begin to question. We question God and we say, God, I don't understand God, why? Why are you taking this? Why are you asking this? Why, are, why is this, why is this what, what I thought was a blessing, what I thought was a gift? Why is all of this, why is this now suddenly going, God, what is, what is happening? Why is this? Because if that's what's most important, sometimes God will test that. And he may even allow that to go to the altar where you say, oh my goodness, I think that, that's dying. I don't see how that is. I thought that was God. It doesn't mean it wasn't God, but perhaps God is testing your heart testing the motives of your heart and he wants to know what is most important the dream or him 
Secondly, God tests our faith to, faith to reveal our trust. God tests our faith to reveal our trust. Genesis 22, 3 through 5. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, and he loaded his donkey, and he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him about. And on the third day, I like that, on the third day. Just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance, and he said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I go, while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Man, that's good stuff right there. You say, what's going on here? Well, what God had called Abraham to do, Abraham had to wrestle with some things. I don't know about you. We don't have all the details. All we see is, is that the, the call came in verses 1 and 2, and then in verse 3 we see that Abraham gets up early the next morning, cuts some wood, and they, they head out early the next morning. We don't know the time in between from when he heard this. We don't know exactly what it is. I've heard messages that he heard it the night before and then went out. We don't know the timing, but I've got to be honest with you. When it comes to his son Isaac, I'm pretty sure when there was a message like this that there was some wrestling that Abraham had to do. There was some wrestling that Abraham had to do. I'm pretty sure that there was some wrestling that, that went on. In fact, the, the text says he got up early, he saddled his donkey, and he headed off. And for what it's worth, I, you know, there are some books that just kind of talk a little bit about Jewish tradition. Not necessarily biblical, but what they pass down as far as Jewish tradition is concerned. And Jewish tradition says he got up early in the morning, he wanted to leave before Sarah woke up. <laughs> I think we read stories like this and we don't think about the dynamics. We don't think the dynamics of this. You know, okay, Abraham hears from God and, and then he's got to, he's got to what? He's got to tell his wife, Sarah, oh, by the way, our son Isaac, you know, the one that was the 25-year promise, you know, uh, the one that, that got, God told me last night that I'm the take of the Mount Moriah and, I, and, and I'm to sacrifice him to the Lord there. <laughs> How do you think that conversation went? Jamie and I have argued about lesser important things. <laughs> I, I can only imagine how, how that conversation went. But Jewish, Jewish tradition says that, that after they, they kind of went with it, that, that, that Sarah was on board, that, that she said, okay, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you, Abraham. But, you know, here it is. I, I, you know, uh, Abraham got up. He woke up early in the morning. I think he got up early in the morning before Sarah woke up because he was afraid she might change her mind. I don't know. You know, women are known to do that. No, maybe they're not. Any of you ever do that? No? Okay. No. But I think that sometimes that's what we overlook. We overlook Sarah. I think we overlook Isaac in the story. We overlook Isaac. He's seen kind of as a passive player, and sometimes we may think of the boy when it, when it talks about the boy and, and it, it, that maybe he was this young boy. But some scholars believe he was 25 years old. Some even suggest he might have been as, as old as 37 years old. And his dad is over 100 years old. You know what that, that tells me? He, that, that Abraham had probably long passed being the strongest member of the family. That Isaac's participation in this, Isaac's willingness to be able to go, was based on what he knew about his dad and his trust that his dad had heard from God. Sarah's willingness to be able to, to allow Abraham to go was based on the character of Abraham and his ability to be able to hear from God. That Abraham had a faith and a trust in God that literally went down and trickled down to impact his family. It impacted his wife. It impacted his son. That's what we see. You see, what God is really calling Abraham to do is to trust him. To trust him. And that part of that trust didn't just involve Abraham, but it involved the entire family. There was this area of trust, and we see that demonstrated by the statements that Abraham makes. How could Sarah and Isaac go along with, with such a plan? How could, they, how could they do that? And I think it's found in that statement that Abraham made to the servants in verse 5. Genesis 22, 5, he told them, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. We will come back to you. That's the foundation. The foundation of Abraham's obedience was his trust in God. His trust that God is the one who made the promise. That Isaac was the son of promise. And that even though this seemed to be somewhat inconsistent, God must have a plan. God must have a way. But I trust him. We will come back. We will come back. 
fact, later on, the text says, as they head up near the mountain where the Lord directed, Isaac asked this question. He trusted his, God, his, his father up to this point, and he asked the question, Father, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? <laughs> the fire and the wood, but hey, where's the lamb? Uh, you know, we will come back to you. Where is the lamb? We're going to sacrifice. I know we're going to sacrifice. Where is the lamb? Isaac might have been getting a little bit nervous. Okay, I've gone on this journey, but how come God isn't providing yet? I've gone on this journey. I'm trusting you, but how come God hasn't provided yet? Any of you ever been on a journey like that and you're still asking God? I know you said you'd provide, but you haven't been providing yet. God, where is the provision? The provision doesn't seem here yet. It's not here. But look at Abraham's response. Genesis 22, 8. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. God will provide the lamb. This is pre. We, 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 if, you, if you read this story, if you know this story, if you've been around, and this is our Sunday school story, and you've been around, you already know the end. So we kind of have this, this disposition in our minds that says, all right, we know everything's going to be okay. But do you realize the tension that is here? Abraham was talking about what God would do and, my, my, and God's going to provide and God's going to provide and now they're making their way up and Isaac is realizing there is no lamb. My father has said that God is going to provide. There's no lamb. He said that I'm the one to be sacrificed. There's no lamb. And Abraham continues walking. He said, my son, God will provide the lamb. God will provide the lamb. This is, a, this is a test of trust. This is a statement of faith. This is all in faith. Abraham fully trusted. He went all in for the Lord and, and what God had promised. Why? Because he trusted God. This is a test of trust. And when God begins to bring you to an all-in moment, it is a test of your trust. It is not only a test of worship. It's not only a test of the Lordship. It is a test of trust. Do you trust the Lord? It's easy when things are going well to say, I trust the Lord. Praise the Lord, I trust him. It's easy after the fact to say, I trust him. But when you're in the moment, when you're walking up the mountain, when you're in that moment and every time seems plodding and getting closer and closer to deadlines, getting closer and closer to the need that you have, and it's not coming as you walk closer and closer and closer, those are the moments that test where your trust truly is. Those are the moments that, that are where the trust is. And we know that his trust was in the Lord. How do we know that? Well, we've got to look in the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 11 gives us a, a, a picture of what Abraham was thinking in those moments, what, why he would be willing to take those steps. And it says in Hebrews 11, 17 to 19, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. They didn't make sense through your offspring, uh, through, through Isaac, your offspring will be reckoned, but I want you to sacrifice him. God, these don't make sense. What did Abraham believe? He didn't know, but it says Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. In his mind, he's saying, even if I have to go through with it, even if I have to go through with it, God told me that my offspring would be reckoned through Isaac. Not through Ishmael, not through another son to come later on, through Isaac. And so if that's going to happen, then God's going to have to raise him back up from the dead. And God is able to do that. And I trust that my God is the author of life and death. And I put my hands in his. I put my son in his hands. And this test revealed Abraham's trust. It revealed that, that he is a promise-keeping God, and that's where his trust was. Let me tell you what I've discovered. It's not always that God wants to take things from you. It's not always that God wants to take. God is not a, a taker. He doesn't always want to take things from you. But when it comes to dreams, when it comes to blessings, when it comes to gifts that God gives us, sometimes he tests us because he wants to know if we're willing to really trust him. In fact, it's not that he really wants to take those things away. He wants to know if we're willing to give them up. 
It's not always that he wants to take them away, but he wants to know if we can be open-handed. He wants to know if we're willing to put them back in his hands, if we're willing to recognize that he's the giver, if we're willing to recognize that he's the owner, if we're willing to recognize that he's the master, if we're willing to say, okay, I'm not going to hang on, but I'm going to put it back in your hands. I'm going to trust you. And, 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 you know, and, 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 and that's the issue. You know, I found sometimes certain things have to die before there's a resurrection. You've got to put some things on the altar. You've got to let some things die. Story after story after story is in the Bible where, where, there, where, where there's a need sometimes for a sacrifice. And, and there's a sacrifice before the resurrection that sometimes things need to die. Whoever wants to save his life must what? That was the scripture we read. Lose it. Sometimes before you can find the salvation, sometimes before you can find the joy, sometimes before you can find the hope, you've got to allow some things to die, or you've got to be willing to let go of some things and put them back in God's hands because you've been hanging on too long. You've been hanging on too much. Mark Batterson, author and pastor at National Community Church, he wrote this, God-ordained dreams aren't just born, they're reborn. If they become more important to you than God, you have to sacrifice them for the sake of your soul. You have to put them on the altar and raise the knife. And once the dream is dead and buried, it can be resurrected for God's glory. See, there are some things that God's given us that have just become more important to us. The blessing that has now become the source of our trust, our joy, our desire, rather than the Lord. And God wants us to trust Him. God desires that we would go all in and surrender it back to Him. And if we do, we find that He will give it back to us with a greater blessing and a greater place. Abraham declared this to Isaac. He said, the Lord will provide. It was a test of his trust. And thirdly, God tests our faith to reveal His ability to provide. God tests our faith to reveal his ability to provide. Genesis 22, 6 to 14, when they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar and there and arranged the wood on it. And he bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. Can you imagine the picture? Here is Isaac. He is bound on the wood. He is bound there. He has been bound, and, 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 and there he is. And Abraham has raised the knife, and he is ready to go through because he is going to trust that God is able to resurrect his son from the dead because that was the promise that through Isaac, his offspring would be rec- reckoned. And here he is right at that moment, and God sees this is a heart that is willing to go through. This is a heart that is willing to trust me. This is a heart that is willing to go through it. And at that moment, it says this, but the angel of the Lord called out from heaven, said, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Don't lay a hand on the boy, he said. Don't do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. And it goes on to say this, Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns and he went over and he took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And so Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said on the mountain uh, of the Lord it will be provided. You know what God reveals through this whole thing? Not only did Abraham have a faith and he told the servants, we will come back and worship you. Not only when Isaac asked, the Lord will provide the lamb. But in that moment, it wasn't just statements of faith and trust. When Abraham was willing to go all in with God, he was able to see that God was the provider that he had trusted. That God was the provider that, that, that he knew all along that he was. He was able to see full hand the provision of the Lord and make the declaration that Yahweh is my provider. Jehovah Jireh is my provider. The Lord who provides. You know, Jehovah Jireh literally means the God who foresees. It literally means who foresees provision. It's an act of foresight. This is an act of foresight. It's anticipating a need that will exist and meeting that need before it happens. You know, and as I, as I said, there's a lot of Jewish tradition. And rabbis, Jewish rabbis, would teach that this particular ram that was, that was caught in the thicket came from the Garden of Eden. 
They, they would oftentimes teach this, that this, this ram grazed under the tree of life and was created at the twilight on the sixth day for this specific purpose of making provision for this moment in history. That's what, that's what Jewish rabbis would teach. Now, I don't know if that's figurative or literal. That, it's, not, it's not in the Bible, so we don't know for sure what that is. It's just tradition and things that they teach. But, you know, it kind of reminds me of Ephesians chapter 1. And Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 to 6 and verse 8, and I want to read it in the message it says this, I love the way it puts it. It says, long before he laid the earth's foundations, he had us in mind, had settled on us as the focus of his love, to be made whole and holy by his love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. And then verse 8, he thought of everything. Provided for everything we could possibly need. <laughs> that's foresight, isn't it? See, that's the God that we serve. The God that we serve is the God that anticipates the needs that we have, has already made provision for those needs if we will trust him. The God that we serve is the God that, 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 that is the maker of heaven and earth, and there is nothing that is not beyond his ability to be able to provide. And he anticipates, and he knows, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he, what, planned for us long ago. God has things provided for you. God has things planned for you. The promises of Scripture, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or God's seat begging for bread. The truth is, God has a plan. God has provision for you. But sometimes we don't see it because we're too busy hanging on to what God has already provided. Hanging on to what God has already blessed us. And we make that the object of our worship. We make that the object of our provision. We say that's what we need for our security. That's what we need to have peace. And he says, no, 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 no. You need to go all in with me and see that I am your provider. I want to demonstrate to you that I will provide for your needs. God the provider has already made every provision for us. That's, that's so hard to comprehend. I wanna, let me illustrate how my difficult that might be to comprehend. Uh, let me tell you about C.J. Tan. He's the guy that led IBM team in, in, in something that was created called Deep Blue. If you don't know what Deep Blue was, Deep Blue was the, the computer that outmaneuvered chess grandmaster Gary Kaspanova and defeated him. Deep Blue, Deep Blue incorporated 32 processing engines that can contemplate 200 million chess moves every second. I don't know about you, but I have a tough time with 50-50 and, and true and false. And those, anybody, you know, like when there's a true and false, I overthink it. And I'm like, oh, it's got to be this. And then it's like, oh, no, that wasn't that. And here it is. This, this I can't even begin to comprehend. 32 processing engines to complicate to contemplate 200 contingencies every second and yet you know what to an omniscient god that's laughable before the creation of the universe he thought of every contingency everything that can be foreseen was provided by god himself and if you understand that then you're willing to put whatever it is that god is calling you to if you ever to put that on the altar because you know that god has already made provision God has already made provision. If that's not the way he's making provision, then he's got something better for you. Then he's got something else he's going to, to give you. But maybe, just maybe, he just wants to see if you're willing to let go of it and, 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 and let him take it. If you're willing to put it back in his hands, if you're willing to surrender, if you're willing to go all in. You know, that's kind of the character, not only the character, but the personality of God. In fact, we see it throughout Scripture that God loves to provide for us, but he loves to do it in dramatic fashion. God is never late, but sometimes for us, it's like, God, you could be a little earlier. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, if you think about it, about the, we, we, you know, the, the, the message of the Lord that was, that was given this morning during, during worship mentioned about the Red Sea. And, and, you know, if you think about it for a moment, the Red Sea experience, did that really need to happen? I mean, here it is. The children of Israel have been, you know, God has already done in dramatic fashion, plague after plague after plague. Finally, Pharaoh says, you know what? I'm so tired of this and sick and get out of here. And so there they go. They get out and, and led by the, the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. And here they go. And God leads them to the Red Sea. Isn't there a different way? Like, I don't understand, God. Why? What are you doing? I, this was your will. You just did all of this, and now look where you lead. You lead us to the Red Sea. We can't get across. What is this? 
And then we turn around and we're hearing the, the, the chariots and we're hearing the, the hooves of horses and we're, we're seeing the Egyptian army that's coming and we're thinking, we're going to die. And what does God do? He says, stand and wait. You're going to see the deliverance. The enemies you see now, you'll never see before. What? Moses, raise up your staff, and in dramatic fashion, at just the right moment, God parts the sea. They just get across. The Egyptian army's pursuing right in, and boom, God does it. Whoa, what? God has a way of providing in dramatic fashion. He's got a way of providing in dramatic fashion. He's got a way of, of waiting until the, until the end. I mean, he, he's just got a way of doing that. You see, it, it's not a matter of God wanting to take things. It's a matter of trust. He wants to build our faith. He wants to build our faith. And that's what God does. God, God wants to impress upon our hearts that he can do the job, that he can give you the promotion, that he can, he's your paycheck, that he's your provider, that he's your healer, that, that he's the one that can do it. And he will do that if we will, if we will surrender to him. If we have a willingness to lay it down, if, if we're willing to trust that God can provide for whatever we need. Here's what God said to Abraham as a result of his willingness to lay Isaac down. He said this, The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possessions of cities of their enemies. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you obeyed me. See, not only does God provide a substitute sacrifice for Isaac, but he renews his covenant promise to Abraham. You see, there was a time when, when Abraham had, had separated from Lot. And he was standing there, and Lot took the well-watered plains of the Jordan, and Abraham is standing left with the rest and the dust of the rest. And God says, I want you to look at the sand. You see the sand? That's going to be your descendants. And then later on, when Abraham is inside his tent, God takes him out, and he says, listen, I want you to look up at the stars. So shall your descendants. But because Abraham was willing to put his son Isaac back in the Lord's hands, he was willing to trust. He was willing to show the Lord that, that Isaac wasn't the center, wasn't the why in which he worshipped God because he would provide him a son. Wasn't the, the what of his worship. Isaac wasn't the what of his worship. Oh, I have this son and now he's the center of my world and I worship him. Because he was willing to trust God, because he was willing, he saw a dramatic provision of God. And that dramatic provision of God led to, led to a renewing of the covenant that God had given him. And that covenant, whether you realize it or not, affects you and I. Father Abraham had many sons, right? If Abraham had not been willing, where would we be? His decision to go all in impacted generations and generations to come. You don't know what your all-in moment will do for those that are following you, for your children, for your children's children, for your children's children's children. You don't know what is the all-in moment, what is the decisive moment, what is the Isaac in your life that God is saying, I want you to lay down, I want you to go all in, because that very moment won't just affect you, but it will will affect generations to come it will affect generations to come At the end of the day I think oftentimes we hold out on God because we think we might miss out we think oh I need all those little things those little things aren't that important the truth is if you're holding out on God you're missing out if you're not putting everything on the altar then you're missing out on the full blessing that God wants to give to you that little thing you're holding on to is nothing in compared, comparison to the blessing that God wants to bring into your life. Some of you are wondering, why don't I feel the fullness of God's grace? Why have I not experienced God's power working through me the way that I, that I read in Scripture? And I think that one of the reasons oftentimes we don't is because we're holding back. Because we're holding back. We're not allowing ourselves to be a full conduit of God's grace and God's power. The things that God wants to do in and through us, He can't do because we're not willing to put it fully on the altar. We're not willing to surrender. We're not willing to go all in with God. We're not willing to go all in. But let me tell you something. The God we serve isn't just a God that is looking for us to go all in and, 
and, and do things for him. He's the God who went all in for us. He went all in for us. And I want to close by making a connection that, that maybe you've already picked up on, kind of leaned into it a little bit and kind of did some fore, forecasting. But we read this story, we say, how could a God uh, put Abraham in this scenario? What kind, of, what kind of God is that? How could God think of this kind of sacrifice? But you know, when we read, we read it twice, and it says this, you have not withheld your son, your only son. Twice it says, your only son, your only son. And that, that might jog our memory to another place in Scripture where we read about God giving his one and only son. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life three day journey for Abraham until they got to Mount Moriah Mount Moriah, Mount Calvary three days later see God allowed his son to go all in he went all in with us through his son Jesus Christ who laid down his life but then was resurrected once again to provide for us our salvation to provide for us our hope to provide for us our power to provide for us whatever we need if that's the kind of God that went all in for us how can we not reciprocate by going all in with him he doesn't ask us to do anything he hasn't been willing to do and more. That's the kind of God we serve. A God that says, I went all in for you. Will you go all in for me? I have provided everything you need through my son Jesus Christ. Are you willing to go all in with me? What are you still holding on to? What are you still trying to make happen in your own strength? What is a promise? You say, but, but God, I know in prayer you, you promised me this. Are you willing to give it up? Are you willing to lay it down? Are you willing to say, God, it's not the object. It's you. It's you. There are some times we don't move forward because we're not willing to give up. We continue to wrestle and we continue to hang on. God says, I got something so much better for you. I got something so much better for you. So my question, I'm going to ask the worship team, what's your Isaac? What are you holding back on God? What are you not going all in with the Lord? God's call is an all-in test. It's a, it's a test of our worship. It's a test of our trust. It's our test of, of our willingness to be able to, to wait and see a God who will provide. Some of you are waiting on God to come through and and in waiting for God to come through, you want a testimony. Well, let me tell you something. You can't have a testimony without a test. I've said it before. You can't have a testimony without a test. And some of you are being tested right now. The question is, are you willing to go all in? Are you willing to go all in for God? Are you willing to go all in for the Lord? Let's bow our heads this morning. Jesus Christ went in all in for us. And maybe you're here today, and maybe you... You don't know Christ. Maybe you've come in, somebody invited you, and, and, uh, or maybe you just the Lord just led you to be here today. It's not by accident today. But you've not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. You've not, you've not asked Jesus Christ to come into your life. You haven't surrendered to his salvation. You, just, you, haven't, you haven't given your life to Christ. You recognize that your life is a mess, that sin has wrecked your life, that that you're far from God. You're far from God. You're far from what He desires. You're far from what He wants for your life. And you say, you know what? I need salvation today. I need to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. If that's you today and you want to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, will you slip up your hand today? I want to give my life to Christ. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. Thank you. There are others today. I want to surrender my life to Christ. It's time. It's time. It's time for me to surrender. It's time for me to give my life to Jesus today. Secondly, today, maybe you're here and you haven't been serving the Lord like you should. You gave your life to Christ, but the way that you've been living, you have not been living for the Lord. You've been living for yourself. And you say, you know what? I've got to surrender today. I've got to, re I've got to, to recommit my life to Christ. I I've got to come to that moment today where I want to recommit and I want to go all in. Jesus, if that's you today, will you slip up your hand today? I need to recommit my life to Christ. I need to recommit my life to Christ. I served him, but I've been walking away. Hallelujah.
And then finally this morning you're here and you say, you know what? I've been serving Jesus. I know Jesus, but there's an Isaac in my life. And I know that the Lord has been prompting me. The Lord has been prompting me. There's an Isaac I've got to let go of. The Lord's been prompting me to let it go. The Lord's been prompting me to give it to him. The Lord's been prompting me to lay it down. The Lord's been prompting me to give up control. If that's you and you say, I need, I need prayer because I want to go all in. I want to finally give my Isaac to the Lord today. If that's you, will you slip up your hand? It might be a dream. It might be whatever. I don't, it might be anything in your life. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let's pray today you raise your hand will you just pray with me today dear Jesus we're tired today of hanging on and doing things our own way we're tired today of turning our dreams or turning your gifts into things you never desired and so today we lay it down we lay our Isaacs down we lay our lives down. We commit our lives to you. We commit our worship to you. We commit our trust to you. We commit ourselves to you. We commit our futures to you. We commit the provision we need to you. Today, we are going all in. Today, we're giving ourselves to you. We ask you to forgive us. Forgive us of our sin. Forgive us of, of making other things the object of our worship. Forgive us of hanging on when you've called us to let go. Today we surrender and we give you everything. We give you everything. We go all in. In Jesus' name.